So we're going to continue now our conversation about principal components analysis. Um, so what we left off last time is that we have this data matrix X, that is M by M, where N is the number of samples and M is the number of measurements. And the principal components analysis is defined as the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix X transpose times X. And what that gets you is this W matrix, which are my, uh, which are my loadings. And this is a M by M matrix. Okay. Now, it turns out that principal components analysis is so popular, it's actually been independently reinvented by a variety of people over the last over 100 years. And so in the literature, it actually goes by a lot of different names, um, depending on your field of study and uh, what kind of literature that your field of study follows. In the field of biology, by and large, I hear people talking about principal components analysis in, in the, in, by calling it PCA, but it does have a lot of other names. So I won't bore you with all of the other names that it has. There's many, many of them. Um, but I will mention one that is particularly important um, because it turns out that this particular computation, literally computing X transpose X and then taking the eigen decomposition of that resultant M by M matrix, is not necessarily the most computationally efficient way of computing W. Right, because W is what we want. We want this M by M matrix that tells us what all of the principal components are. And really, sometimes we only want the first couple, right? Um, so it turns out that if you actually wanted to compute W in a more computationally efficient way, there is a, uh, there's another linear algebra object called the singular value decomposition that a lot of people use because it is a better way of computing W without actually constructing this M by M matrix. Okay, so we're going to talk about the the singular value decomposition. And this is, as you'll see, it turns out to be um, mathematically identical to the PCA in a certain way, but it's usually implemented differently in terms of the numerical linear algebra, how people actually compute the singular value decomposition. And uh, you'll also, I also wanted to, you to know this word because sometimes you'll hear, hear people talking about SVD. Um, and in your head, you should really think that PCA and SVD are practically interchangeable. They're more or less the same thing. Okay, so um, so the SVD uh, also gets you started with the same data matrix X. This is the same data matrix X that we had all along. Uh, this M by M uh, matrix of data, and I'm going to um, decompose this data matrix as a product of three different matrices. Okay, so I'm going to turn one matrix X, that's the decomposition part, into three matrices, U, sigma, and V star. Okay, so U, V, U, V, and sigma are the three matrices I'm going to construct in order to reconstruct X, right? This equality should hold exactly, right? Now, um, in case you don't know what a star is, a star is the conjugate transpose of V, right? Um, transpose you already know about. It's just that it's, I've been denoting it as T, so this is a transpose over here, right? Where you uh, index the matrix the other way around. What the conjugate means is that in case that V is, um, is a matrix that's complex valued that has a non-zero imaginary component, you also take the conjugate of every complex value inside V. Um, and it's written this way because the singular value decomposition is actually incredibly general. X does not have to be full of real valued numbers. It could have complex numbers in it. And this equality, this decomposition still holds. Um, practically speaking, if you are thinking about collecting data of most ordinary sorts, X is going to be real valued. And so you can just think of this V star as V transpose. And it's, it's, it's a, a fine way of thinking about it if you don't have complex valued um, things to worry about. OK, so what we're going to do uh, is then specify some of the, the nice properties of uh, these matrices. And, uh, and I'll, I'll just tell you what they mean, OK? Um, so this U here is uh, known as the left singular vectors. And you probably guessed that the V here is known as the uh, right singular vectors. Okay? 
And what that leaves us is this sigma matrix here, which actually contains the singular values on its diagonal. Okay, so I'll be a little more explicit about what I mean. Um, if you looked at this matrix sigma, what you'll see is that it has along its diagonal singular value 1, singular value 2, singular value 3, et cetera, et cetera, and every other number is a 0. Okay? So these are our singular values. These are right singular vectors. And it turns out that if you compared this v to our w over there, obtained by the other computation, they're identical. Okay? v is identical to our w. You can, they're, they're just the same. They're exactly the same. Right? Um, so the nice features of this formulation of the SVD is that there's a couple of nice properties that uh, we haven't mentioned yet. So one nice property is that we have sigma here, which is, uh, which is diagonal. And so each singular value, you can think of it as kind of like that eigenvalue we were talking about earlier. Right? So we got w, and uh, we also got these eigenvalues here, these uh, lambdas. So the lambdas are not identical to these, um, to, to these, uh, to these to these singular values, uh, but they are proportional to each other. And we can interpret them in the same way. These are, they, they come out ordered, and so sigma 1 is always bigger than sigma 2, which is always bigger than sigma 3. So they're ordered. Okay? And since the first singular value corresponds to the first column of u and the first column of v, right, they, you can interpret them in a very similar way using the intuition we talked about earlier with interpreting the, the, the columns of w, right? Because w is identical to v. So the first column of v corresponds to the largest singular value, and the second column of v corresponds to the next smaller singular value. That's a nice property. Uh, the other property that's really nice um, is that these u and v's are unitary matrices. And that means that u star times u is the identity matrix and v star times v is the identity matrix. These are nice properties. OK? So what you can see is that after you've done this singular value decomposition of our data matrix x, right? remember we had the loadings earlier. It's a thing that we called t, right? So t was equal to x times w, right? And, um, and since w is the same as v, right? I have x over here. I'm going to right multiply it with v, right? So x times v equals u sigma v star v, right? But remember that v star v is the identity matrix. And so this actually goes away. This equals the identity, and we can ignore it. And so t is just equal to u times sigma. Right? So we get the loadings, uh, we get the scores, rather. We get the scores, the projections of our data onto the first couple of components for free after we've computed the singular value decomposition. We already have u and, uh, we have u and sigma. And this multiplication is really easy because since sigma is full of zeros, all we're really doing is multiplying every column of u by a single number, and that's it. Right? That gives us all of the scores. And the same truncation also applies, right? If we wanted, um, if we wanted the, the truncated version, and uh, we're going to take, let's say, the, only the first two principal components by taking the first two columns of v, what we can do uh, is here, t sub r is equal to the truncated r times the truncated sigma, which works exactly the same way as before. We take the first two columns of u and take the first block, the two by two block of sigma. And do that multiplication, and we'll get the same truncated. Um, we'll get the same truncated scores like we did before. Um, and this is just nice because the SVD is super fast. Okay, there are really, really efficient algorithms out there for computing the SVD, and so we like using the SVD as a means of computing the PCA, especially if the data matrix for PCA happens to be, ge be getting a little bit larger. So often, this is more efficient than actually computing um, x transpose x, especially if your number of, um, of measurements m is large. 
right? Because you end up with a much larger covariance matrix. But then you don't actually want the covariance matrix. You only want W, which is this eigen decomposition. And this is a way of getting to that W, also known as V, by a different computation that's done a little more efficiently. OK? So the next thing I'm going to tell you about uh, is how to pick R, which is a really, really important topic. OK? Because I've told you that it has this nice property that if you wanted the first five, I'm going to tell you you should take the first five. And that's guaranteed to be true. But how do you know if you should be taking five or six or seven or maybe just two? Maybe the first two are good enough. How do you know the answer to that question? Well, it turns out that if you uh, look at your singular values um, or your eigenvalues by this method, they're just think of them as, as very similar objects, um, then there is a, there's a set of things that you can do to inform yourself about how many different dimensions of the data that you can be truncating, what R, how small of an R you can get away with. Okay? So what we're going to do is look at our singular values, these, uh, these sigmas. And remember, they're ordered. And so they're guaranteed to get smaller as you go down the diagonal. And what we're going to do uh, is once we've computed them, we can plot the following plot. Okay? So this is uh, what we're going to do is um, take the cumulative sum of the, uh, of, the, of the singular values. So I'm going to take the sum of all of my singular values from 1 to k. All right? And here is the k singular values. Okay? So if k equals 1, then this is just the first singular value. We're going to have a number. If k equals 2, then it's going to just be the sum of the first two. We're going to have a number. Then the first three, and the first four, and the first five, and the first six, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll end up with a plot that looks something like that. Because what's going to happen is because singular values get smaller and smaller as you keep going, the cumulative sum of them is going to flatten out into a plateau. And it's going to approach a maximum. Um, and, that's, and you can normalize that maximum to be 1, right? which means I've explained all the data, noise and all. Right? Now, what you're looking for is the shape of this curve. Because a couple of different things can happen. Right? It could be super sharp, where the first couple of components gives us all of the variance, and it goes like that. Or in the other extreme, it could be pretty shallow and look something like that. Okay? Now, the shape of that curve tells you a lot about what's happening in the system. It tells you about how low dimensional the system actually is, how many numbers of singular values, what's this k that you can actually get away with truncating. Because in the case of, uh, of this really sharp curve here, where you have a really sharp elbow, uh, or, or shoulder in the data, you can say that, OK, so here's one singular value. Here's two singular values. Here's three singular values. Really, that's it, right? Adding any more singular values, adding any more principal com comp components to my explanation of the data really is not going to help me because there's no more variance in the data to be explained. I can pretty safely truncate this case at r equals 3, right? Whereas in the other extreme, where you have a spectrum that's more like this shallow curve here, where there's not really an obvious break in the function, um, then you have a, a more complicated decision to be making. Right? It, there's no obvious breaking point where you can cut it off and say, OK, that's it. This explains all the data. I can be done here, and I can have a low dimensional system. Because as you add more and more singular values, it really does keep explaining more and more of the data. So there you have um, some more of a practical problem, right? Because you can't just keep all of them. But how many you pick is sort of starts to be a little bit of arbitrary. Um, and so the practical considerations are the following. So for example, if you want to visualize your data, even if the spectrum looks like this, sometimes picking the first two just for visualizing purposes is perfectly fine because that's a nice way of just looking at the data, right? So you can pick the first two, project everything onto r equals 2, and plot uh, t sub r, right? t sub 2. So it has uh, two columns. Right? n samples, two columns, those are the projections of your data onto the first two principal components. And you can look at them that way, even if your spectrum of singular values look like that. The other thing that a lot of people do is uh, set some kind of hard threshold and say, I want to keep enough singular values so that I can explain 95% of the variance in the data. Right? So there, we're going to draw some kind of threshold. Right? That's my 95% threshold. And wherever these two lines cross, that's what I'm picking. 
That's my r right there. Okay? And it does seem a slightly arbitrary because, well, why not one smaller or one more? There's not a huge difference. And that's true. But this is a, a useful construct because it allows you to have a principled and consistent way of picking this r, even for spectra that are a little more ambiguous. Um, people also use this r, this value r, of how many singular values I need to keep in order to explain 95% of the data as a proxy measure for the kind of the high dimensionality or complexity of the data. Right? So uh, for example, you can collect two data sets that are the same dimensionality. They both have m measurements. Right? And if you SVD both of them and look at these curves for the two, you might see that one of them looks more like the shallow one here, and the other one has the shoulder. Okay? And if you apply the same criterion for both of them, uh, of first point across the 95% line, right? for one of them, this r be much smaller than the r over here. And so that's a one way of assessing the true dim low dimensionality of the system. Right? So if you compare the two, you can say, oh, this one really does have simpler, more low dimensional structure, because uh, the singular value that crosses the 95% line is a much smaller number than for the other data set. And so that is a nice way of, of assessing how complicated your data set really is, despite the large number of measurements that's underlying.